This month marks the bicentenary of the death of Napoleon Bonaparte. A household name around the world, and echoing the terror that the mere mention of his name rippled through the royal courts of Europe, the commemoration of his passing, even today, two centuries later, similarly evokes gasps of indignation through the numerous vacuous news articles pointing out that he was controversial, pro-slavery, misogynistic, and a megalomaniac, frequently drawing absurd parallels between him and Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, and every other despot that fits the narrative. Meanwhile, the conservative right in France celebrate him as the greatest Frenchman in history, a military and political genius whose legacy ultimately changed the world for the better. And then there's President Macron, treading a very fine, nervous, politically expedient line by on the one hand agreeing to lay a wreath at his tomb in commemoration, but on the other expeditiously declaring that his participation in the ceremony is neither a denial nor a repentance of the life of Napoleon, and that he wouldn't shy away from the controversies surrounding his infamous predecessor. So where does the truth really lie? To students of history, it should be curious why a political leader that lived over 200 years ago still remains such a political hot potato. Maybe it's just revisionist history gone mad. Maybe it's just well-cemented British propaganda. Regardless of the prevailing narrative, his enormous achievements in fields as diverse as war and art, politics and education, religion and jurisprudence, behove us to take a deeper look at this complex genius, who he was, what he did, and why. Our story begins on the Mediterranean island of Corsica, nestled in the armpit of Italy's Ligurian Sea. It is the fourth largest island in the Mediterranean and has been occupied by humans since at least the Middle Stone Age. Eventually, parts of it came to be occupied by the Carthaginians, then the Greeks, then the Etruscans, and ultimately the Romans, who, as usual, conquered it properly, selling much of the population into slavery then colonising, organising and building it into a part of their larger empire. After the collapse of Rome, it became a forgotten backwater from which it never really recovered, made worse by the pillaging of various barbarian hordes. Eventually, it came into the hands of the Byzantines, Charlemagne's Frankish Empire and then the Lombards, who began to fortify the island. By the middle of the 11th century AD, Islamic expansion from North Africa threatened the island and the republics of Genoa and Pisa mobilised to garrison the forts and repel Muslim raids. As part of their defence strategy, settlers were poured in from Tuscany, such that the local culture, while eclectic, took on a strongly Italian flavour and the native language largely transformed from various native pidgin languages through osmosis into a uniform Tuscan dialect that persisted on the island, yet all but died out on the mainland. By the end of the 13th century, this burgeoning Pisan influence eventually passed into the hands of their now rival republic, Genoa. However, both the Pope and the King of Aragon made claims upon the island, which saw it become the subject of continual feudal wrangling and conflict. By the turn of the 15th century, disgruntled locals began turning on their foreign claimants and a number of popular uprisings signalled the emergence of a distinct Corsican national consciousness. Their troubles only continued, however, as Barbary pirate raids from the south were punctuated only by Spanish and French conflicts that often took place in the region. The French regularly did deals with the Ottomans who aided their raids on Spanish holdings to the great resentment of the Christian population. The Corsican nobility sought the protection of the Genoese 
who aided them in repelling the Franco-Ottoman menace and established a string of fortifications around the island. However, the Genoese were now themselves heavily in debt and levied substantial taxes upon the Corsican population for its ongoing defence. To add insult to injury, Corsican nobles were now largely excluded from administrative and leadership positions in the local government, which fueled their growing resentment, ongoing dissent, and eventually, in 1729, outright rebellion against Genoa in a war of independence that in 1755 saw the establishment of the Republic of Corsica under the leadership of Pasquale Paoli. This revolutionary republic was founded upon Enlightenment principles with a representative government, constitution, enfranchisement of women who had full voting rights and participation in public life. Paoli's vision of independence, democracy and liberty would go on to inspire European intellectuals like Voltaire, Rousseau and others that would directly influence the course of European and American history. However, the new republic was unable to completely wrest the island from the hands of the Genoese, who still held several key fortresses. In a political turnaround, the Genoese, effectively bankrupt and unable to hang on much longer, requested aid from the French, against whom they had themselves fought for control of the island not that long ago. The French, devastated after their recent defeat in the Seven Years' War, with their resulting colonial dispossessions and still harbouring designs on Corsica, were only too happy to march their troops in and reinforce the Genoese. The British, desperate to deny the French any further outposts in the Mediterranean and thus future headaches for themselves, quietly poured money and resources to the aid of the Corsican Republic. The French eventually sidelined the Genoese, while at the same time charging them for the costs of their protection and racking up an impossible debt for the Genoese to repay. This effectively forced them to cede Corsica to France as payment, whereupon they were quickly themselves expelled while the French rolled up their sleeves to sort out the rebels once and for all, settling old scores in the process. So it was that in 1767, the French began an offensive across the whole island, against which the Corsicans desperately fought in both open and guerrilla battles. After fighting the Genoese for over 40 years, now exhausted, hugely outnumbered and outgunned, after another year of fighting the French, the last battalions of the Corsican army, comprised of both women and men, made their last stand and were mowed down by French line infantry at the Battle of Ponte Novo. The cause being lost, Paoli fled to Britain and became a celebrity, as well as, privately at least, renouncing his republican ideals and warming to the virtues of monarchy, from whom he received a nice pension. By 1770, Corsica was a province of France. The reason for going into this protracted history of the island is that our protagonist, Napoleon, was born the year France conquered Corsica in 1769 in the town of Ajaccio on the west coast of the island that is now its capital. But we'll get to that in a moment. Napoleon's father, Carlo Maria Buonaparte, was a Corsican noble whose family had immigrated from Tuscany in the 1500s. His mother, Donna Maria Letizia Ramolino, was also of noble birth, descended from a Genoese family. Carlo was sent at an early age to study law in Pisa and eventually returned home, married and served as secretary and personal assistant to Pasquale Paoli in his new government of the Corsican Republic. He grew very close to Paoli who sent him on diplomatic missions abroad, especially to the Vatican where he remained for some time. He returned home to Corsica on the eve of the Genoese handover to the French and, with his heavily pregnant wife, joined Paoli in his military campaigns against them. With Paoli's eventual defeat and exile, many of the remaining Corsican nobility began negotiations with the French 
receiving amnesties and decent terms of capitulation. So it was with Carlo Buonaparte. He quickly took advantage of his international contacts and diplomatic skills and re-established the family in their family home in Ajaccio, becoming a senior official for the French government and even continuing his studies to earn a doctorate in law from the University of Pisa, eventually being appointed to represent Corsica in the court of Louis XVI. Things were looking good for the Buonapartes. After being rebels on the run, they had successfully ingratiated themselves with the French and were making a decent income and took their place in the affluent upper echelons of Corsican society. Don Carlo and Donna Letizia would go on to have 13 children, the fourth child and second son being Napoleon, future emperor of France, king of Italy, etc., etc. Now, Napoleone's mother was a tough and confident woman who was married off by parental arrangement at the tender age of 13 and started having babies soon after. Still a child herself, she had barely become a mother when she had to bury her firstborn son. Forced to take charge of domestic duties, she ran her home and husband's business with the skill and assiduity that teenagers today would deem impossible, yet she did so diligently. While her husband was away, she was inevitably drawn into the political conflict of her homeland and when he returned, she joined him and became a mountainous partisan fighter while heavily pregnant with their fourth child. She was tough and disciplined out of necessity and was to become a major influence on the character of the young Napoleone, whose feisty nature needed a firm hand and continual restraint as life slowly returned to normal on Corsica. Napoleon would view this incredible woman's influence as vitally important and frequently made mention of his belief that a child's future would be largely determined by the involvement of its mother. In light of his great reverence of the crucial role Letizia played in his own life, it's hardly realistic to accuse Napoleon of misogyny at a time when a woman's role as homemaker was an esteemed and vital occupation. Corsicans were no pushovers, and Corsican women even less so. Napoleon was certainly not blind to that. The young Napoleone, named after his deceased older brother, was sent at the age of nine, along with his older brother Joseph, to the mainland in hopes of securing both a superior education as well as integration into the French political strata. But things were about to get tough all round for Napoleone, who at first was enrolled at a religious school, which he hated, so was transferred to a military school instead. At this time, like most Corsicans, he spoke not a word of French, being raised to speak both Italian and its Corsican derivative. The French generally despised Corsicans as backward, and his classmates took special exception to Napoleon, bullying and ridiculing him as if he were an ignorant colonial. Despite learning French within a year, he spoke with a heavy Corsican accent that only made things worse. The normally rambunctious Napoleon had become ever more withdrawn and melancholy. Friendless and lonely, he instead threw himself into reading, spending long hours alone in the library, studying, while his classmates enjoyed themselves in frivolous boyhood pursuits. He took a special liking to mathematics, geography and history, even considering a career as a writer, eventually penning a history of Corsica and trying his hand at a short novel. Successfully completing his studies in 1784, he was accepted into the École Militaire in Paris to train as an artillery officer where his exceptional mathematical knowledge and speed of calculation of trajectories would see him excel. Just as things were beginning to look up, his father suddenly died. Carlos' fondness for gambling and wasteful spending saw the family back home become virtually destitute. Under severe economic pressure, Napoleon crammed two years' worth of study into one, becoming, in late 1785, the first Corsican to graduate from the college and earning himself a commission as a second lieutenant in the Lafayette Artillery Regiment 
at the age of 16. He served on the mainland, expanding his study of mathematics and physics to include topography, essential for any gunner, for which his natural aptitude and serious study drew the attention of senior officers who quickly saw his potential. He also immersed himself in reading philosophical works by Voltaire and Rousseau, which, along with his study of Corsican history, stoked his emerging Republican sympathies and a revulsion for feudal and religious institutions, despite his own noble heritage and having a cardinal in the family. Having now spent most of his youth on the mainland, he still felt like an outsider, which only served to deepen his Corsican patriotism. At the outbreak of the French Revolution in 1789, Napoleon was 19 years old, with a chip on his shoulder and a head full of big ideas. He became a strong advocate of the Jacobin ideals of centralised Republican government and their socialist interventionist policy to effect widespread social change. Abolition of the church and its replacement with a religious institution that would be loyal and subservient to the needs of the state. With the installation of a revolutionary government in Paris came a flurry of amnesties for former exiles, among them one for Pasquale Paoli, who was enjoying the high life in London, but was still keen to have another crack at creating an independent Corsica. The British government consented and gave him leave, but conditioned it on his acting for the interests of Britain, which basically now meant supporting the idea of a constitutional monarch rather than a republic for Corsica, for which Britain would offer Corsica ongoing support and protection. So Paoli had now become, in the strictest sense, a paid-off British agent. So it was that Paoli, now a celebrity even in Republican Paris, returned to Corsica to participate in local elections. Upon hearing of his imminent return, the young Napoleone, who idolised him, contrived to be transferred to Corsica as an election supervisor so that he could meet his hero and father's one-time bosom buddy. However, the feelings weren't mutual at all. Paoli viewed Napoleon's father as a traitor for capitulating to the French, despite his own abandonment of the country and subsequent cushy setup in Britain. His disdain for the Bonaparte family was a crushing blow to the idealistic young officer who became increasingly conflicted about who and what he was, now also becoming increasingly suspicious of Paoli, who was duly elected as president of the local government in Corsica. Disillusioned, he returned to his regiment, but as hostility spread, he was once again seconded to Paoli, who was instructed to invade Sardinia. Now, at this time, the British had an interest in occupying Sardinia, so Paoli secretly gave orders to the commanding officer, who was his nephew, to fail in the expedition against them. Paoli had Napoleon promoted to colonel and gave him command of two companies of Corsican guards sending them, unbeknowns, on a suicide mission to take a fortress that had been both forewarned and reinforced by Paoli's agents. The attack was, as expected, a complete disaster, but Napoleon was astute enough to realise his own commanding officer was complicit in the setup. So he returned to Parliament in Paris and reported the entire scam, denouncing Paoli as a traitor despite his huge reputation contrasting Napoleon's own relative insignificance. His gamble paid off and the government believed him, sending troops to arrest Paoli, but by this time Paoli had colluded with a number of escaped royalists who were on the island and they quickly expelled the police contingent along with Napoleon's entire family. Paoli then implemented martial law and declared Corsican secession from France and instead, abandoning his own once cherished Republican dreams, made it a British Crown Protectorate instead, with the blessing and firepower of the Royal Navy, who just happened to show up out of nowhere. Let's just pause for a moment to take this all in 
so we can get some better perspective. We have a young and impressionable colonial child, heavily doted on by his mother and missing the presence of his father, who was preoccupied by great matters of state, life and death, a figure he is expected to emulate. Highly intelligent and studious, he is transplanted into an alien environment, constantly bullied and humiliated by privileged mainlanders. Treated like an outcast, with no compatriots, friends or benefactors, he withdraws in lonely solitude and consumes every book he can. He resolves to embrace his Corsican heritage and its Republican Enlightenment ideals with pride, developing a disdain for the bourgeois classes that rejected him. As the French Revolution explodes, he finds himself inspired by the egalitarian and fraternal ideals of the Republic and throws himself completely behind it, eventually discovering that one of his great idols was now both a sellout and a traitor. So while Paoli was handing Corsica over to the British, Colonel Napoleon meanwhile had been assigned to participate in the Siege of Toulon, a highly fortified coastal fortress and key French naval port that was not only still in the hands of royalists but reinforced by the British Navy, who put aside their usual hatred of the French to aid the royalists in overthrowing the revolution. We need to remember that despite all the feudal warfare and pointless territorial aggression that characterised European monarchies for centuries, the one thing that they all had in common was their paranoid fear of liberal democracy, in particular republican representative government, which went one step beyond even a constitutional monarchy by abolishing all aristocratic institutions and, more horrifyingly, had the habit of lopping off the heads of everyone in the privileged classes, as had just happened to Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. That was a fate worse even than Muslim conquest, so basically all the monarchies of Europe and even the Italian quasi-micro-republics turned their guns on France, terrified that the virus of fundamentalist republicanism might spread to their own lands. It just so happened that the besieging artillery commander at Toulon had been killed and Napoleon was hastily appointed to be his replacement by the local commissar who happened to also be a Corsican and took him under his wing. Using his knowledge of topography and gunnery placement, Napoleon came up with a bold plan to build a number of artillery posts and concentrate fire into key enemy positions, which proved to be a masterstroke. Leading a subsequent assault and being wounded in the battle, the troops under his command forced the enemy to surrender and the British Navy subsequently withdrew from what was considered to be an impregnable fortress. The commanding officer, recognising Napoleon's genius in breaking the deadlock, reported in his dispatch, I have no words to describe Bonaparte's merit, much technical skill, an equal degree of intelligence and too much gallantry. It was this key moment that demonstrated Napoleon's great potential. But he was still way down in the pecking order, given both his age and Corsican heritage. Over the next 12 months, he was overlooked for promotion and instead assigned to a number of duties that were well inferior to his rank, which he did himself no favours by voicing discontent, even requesting a transfer to Istanbul turning his attention to courting his sister-in-law, biding his time, and even writing a novel while away. Eventually, in 1795, royalist forces began to counterattack, and when they seized a large part of the capital, Napoleon was recalled to aid in the defence of Paris. He took charge of the parliamentary precinct and used a number of cannons to devastating effect on royalist troops such that his unit almost single-handedly repulsed the royalist attack. The revolutionary government, desperate for competent commanders, could no longer ignore his brilliance and he became an instant local celebrity. He was quickly immersed into Parisian high society 
though his reception by the French intelligentsia was mixed. It was during one of these soirees that he was introduced to Josephine. Marie-Joseph Rose Tacheur de la Paguerie was the daughter of a once wealthy sugar plantation owner in the French Caribbean, who had fallen on lean times after cyclones had devastated his estate, leaving him virtually bankrupt. Family connections saw his oldest daughter quickly married off to the son of a mainland noble, the Viscount de Beauharnais. She bore him two children, though the marriage was an unhappy one, with hubby frequently away at war, or with mistresses, or otherwise consistently occupied at the local brothel and gambling den. The government was unimpressed with him as well, and in light of his peerage, coupled with a lacklustre military performance in the defence of France, he was promptly arrested by the revolutionary equivalent of the Gestapo and parted with his head soon after. Mrs. Viscountess Beauharnais came under the spotlight herself and despite hardly eating cake, she was imprisoned and awaiting a similar fate as her husband. However, while in jail, she made friends with colourful socialite and courtesan sex legend Therese Cabarus who had pretty much slept with every politician in France, except maybe Maximilien Robespierre, so he put her in prison just to spite her. Anyway, her current squeeze was Jean Lambert Tallien, a prominent politician and sworn opponent of Robespierre, who was, at the time, on a guillotine frenzy mission of execution that has come to be called the Reign of Terror. In their subsequent scramble for power, Tallien managed to get Robespierre's head lopped off before he could lose his own, and afterwards quickly got his lovey Therese off the hit list, along with Beauharnais, the two women becoming great friends and full-on Paris party girls. Therese taught her new bestie everything she knew about playing men for suckers, and was happy to let her new apprentice practice on her throwaway boyfriends, among them our protagonist, country bumpkin made good, Napoleon. Josephine played him like a violin, and he was soon smitten like a lovesick teenager, breaking off his current engagement and pouring reams of love letters at her, many of which survive today. Unsurprisingly, Josephine, as he chose to call her, treated him like garbage, rarely replying to his letters, and when she did, she was usually quite blasé and abrupt. Many of his letters to her despaired about her lack of reciprocation. She played him so well that he kept a picture of her in his pocket, and his officers regularly caught him gazing at and kissing it throughout the day. Now, this whole liaison was set up by local power broker and politician Viscount Paul Barat, probably the most licentious, corrupt and immoral Frenchman in Paris at the time. And that's saying something. He was currently in bed with both Josephine and Therese and was finding Josephine just a little bit dull compared to master lovemaker Therese, yet she was herself quite the big spender. As their sugar daddy, he was beginning to feel the pinch in his wallet and seeing a novel way to get rid of her, as well as fresh rock star Napoleon, he commissioned the 26-year-old doe-eyed Corsican as a brigadier general and hustled Josephine to show him a good time. Barat made her an offer she couldn't, as the mafia saying goes, refuse and went so far as engineering for her to marry Napoleon, who, Kama sutra to the eyeballs, thought all his Christmases had come at once. Josephine, indignant but heavily in debt, grudgingly acceded. So the newlywed Napoleon, flushed with post-marital swagger, reluctantly departed Paris without his new Mrs. Buonaparte and whistled his way to Nice, even changing the spelling of his surname to sound more French. 
Josephine, on the other hand, remained in Paris and continued to, shall we say, hone her courtesan skills with an ongoing raft of other amorous punters. When the news reached Mama Bonaparte and his sisters, they were far from impressed. Josephine was significantly older than he, a widow and encumbered by two spoiled aristocratic brats from her first marriage, along with huge debts incurred living the high life in Paris. Not only was she haughty and arrogant, but she was high maintenance, with a scandalous public reputation of sleeping around. Compared to Corsican women and his ex, Desiree Clary, who were frugal, maternal and devoted, the Buonaparte girls felt that Josephine was entirely the wrong fit for their intensely dedicated brother, who had taken on the burden of supporting the welfare of his mother and siblings after the death of his father. Not only that, but Josephine was by now completely incapable of having any more children, probably due to venereal disease or botched abortions. But she kept this information from her husband, who was very keen to be a father as soon as possible. Josephine and the Buonaparte girls continued their feud to the end of their lives, causing Napoleon no end of stress. Arriving at Nice, Napoleon found his assigned battalions to be a poorly supplied rabble, full of disloyal, even pro-royalist elements, with generally poor discipline and even poorer morale. He rolled up his sleeves, sacked all officers who were not Jacobin Republicans or had reliable leadership qualities and instilled harsh discipline, while at the same time implementing broad literacy and training exercises among the troops to boost their morale and loyalty to the Republican cause. He regularly walked around the barracks getting to know every one of his officers by name and took an active interest in them personally. He was well known to write letters of both chastisement and encouragement to lower ranking officers who were struggling with alcoholism or other personal issues. Within a year, the men in his army grew to admire him as he transformed what would come to be known as the Army of Italy into a slick, well-disciplined fighting machine that in 1796 would sweep through Italy in an astonishing series of victories, crushing the Sardinians, Genoese, Piedmontan, Tuscan, Papal, Venetian and Austrian armies in a blitzkrieg across the north of the country, crushing armies often double his size that led to the collapse of the first coalition against France and cementing his reputation as a daring, talented and creative commander. He now set up a number of newspapers and journals and printed motivational propaganda for his troops. Plundering the wealthy aristocrats of Italy, he sent millions of dollars worth of art, gold and jewellery to Paris, stabilising the government treasury but he also ensured his soldiers benefited from the booty, while at the same time setting up schools, hospitals and public buildings to encourage ordinary Italians to see the benefit of their revolutionary ideology. It was this work that would eventually lead to the realisation of the dream of a unified Italy by Garibaldi in 1861. Napoleon fully appreciated the value of marketing as well as the cult of personality. Many view his frequent self-portraits and exaggerated campaign reports to be pure vanity and perhaps the outcast Corsican schoolboy side of him relished the chance to stick it to the snob bougies that bullied him so long ago. But he was far too clever and pragmatic to lose sight of his real ideals, which were to create a more equitable and just society and he used all the means at his disposal to do it, even taking the lessons of Byzantine Emperor Constantine to leverage the church to serve the state of France. So he left the politicians in Paris to do their thing, while he instilled his troops with loyalty and devotion to each other and their country, and they loved him for it. Political strife never being too far away and still loyal to shyster Barat, 
he dispatched troops back to Paris to support the government whenever a royalist threat seemed imminent. While it stabilized the government, it also had the effect of making it ever more dependent upon him, which began to make them nervous. So when Napoleon began suggesting a campaign into Egypt that would block British supply chains and eventually link up with anti-British insurgents in India, Bara and the government were only too happy to send him off on the wild goose chase that would remove him from local influence. While all this was going on, Napoleon continued to write frenzied love letters to Josephine, begging her to come to him, but she dodged and weaved her way out of leaving Paris by every means she could, at one time even lying that she was pregnant and that it was unsafe for her to travel. When he caught up with her some months later and seeing no belly, she remarked almost in passing that she had had a miscarriage. Napoleon, it seems, was, in matters of love, quite the opposite of the insightful and intuitive commander he was on the battlefield and broke down sobbing for weeks about the loss of his son. Turning back to his mission, the army finally departed for Egypt by mid-May of 1798, stopping briefly to liberate Malta from the Knights Hospitaller, who, despite their illustrious military history, by this time had become a largely corrupt, indolent and oppressive government, such that the island was conquered within 48 hours and France gained an important naval base without barely firing a shot. Napoleon was an avid student of history and, like many Europeans of the time, was fascinated by ancient Egypt and the mysterious oriental cultures of the Levant. He was inducted into the Academy of Sciences and brought with him an expedition of hundreds of archaeologists, artists, mathematicians and scholars to study and document the areas they conquered. It was thanks to Napoleon that the Frenchman Champollion got hold of the Rosetta Stone and finally translated ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs for the world. His dazzling conquest of Egypt almost seemed like child's play, but his subsequent march north into Palestine proved to be a death trap, with plague, heat stroke and fatigue decimating his ranks. Admiral Lord Nelson, meanwhile, had destroyed Napoleon's Mediterranean fleet just outside of Alexandria, so he was now left with no supplies, no means of reinforcement or evacuation and his siege of Acre proved to be a failure. Returning by road to Egypt, he made the clinical but arguably necessary decision to leave behind troops unfit to travel, or who were terminally ill with bubonic plague, and suggested to his doctors that giving them poison might be a humane way of ending their suffering. Many today view this as a stain on his character, and yet... Medics during wars throughout the 20th century routinely categorized battlefield casualties and gave morphine shots to ease the passing of those rejected for treatment. Even today, there is a growing debate to legislate for euthanasia. While his Middle East campaign was unraveling, Napoleon was nevertheless kept abreast of developments in Europe and knew full well that in his absence, the Austrians had reinvaded Italy and a second coalition had now been formed by everyone in Europe except the Prussians. And they were now joined by the Ottomans against them as well, winning a number of battles and throwing France into panic. It was also back in Egypt that Napoleon was finally informed by his loyal General Junot of Josephine's ongoing and rampant adultery. Junot could no longer stay silent in the face of his commander being cartooned as a cuckolded laughingstock all over Paris. It was here, in the desert heat, suffering from malaria and bearing the responsibility of the lost fleet and failed expedition that he finally snapped. He apparently withdrew for days and his generals reported his never being the same man again. He had determined to divorce Josephine as soon as he got back to France, but first he had to crush the coalition. <laughs> 
By 1799, he was back in Paris and drawing together a number of reliable politicians, instigated a coup d'etat to depose the incompetent and ineffective government, setting up instead a Roman style of consulship, which he would head. Ostensibly, it was a dictatorship, but it's been commented that true dictatorships are characterized by military men holding all the portfolios. Napoleon, despite having a tendency to micromanage, nevertheless employed civilians and professionals in political portfolios and was known to take their advice even when he disagreed with them. He left bureaucracy to the bureaucrats and kept his generals on the battlefield where they belonged. In this crucial way, he lacked both the paranoia and incompetence that are synonymous with modern dictators, even when assassination attempts were made against him. At the same time, his consulship enabled him to raise a new army, which he marched around and over the Italian Alps in a tribute to Hannibal. Arriving in Italy, he completely surprised the invading Austrians and defeated them at the Battle of Marengo. He sent another army into Bavaria, crushing the Austrians once again and forcing them to sue for peace within a month of starting his campaign. Italy was pretty much back in Napoleon's hands and the French borders were once again secure. The next two years saw the other continental players basically withdraw while Napoleon forced the Portuguese to close their ports to the British. The population had become so fatigued by purges and incompetent government that they yearned for a firm hand to stabilize the country and in a number of elections and plebiscites Napoleon was overwhelmingly elected as consul for the next 10 years. It was during this time that he made another important decision that has left commentators in a lather about his character. It refers to his repeal of the abolishment of slavery that was declared by the revolutionary government in 1794. The suggestion has been that Napoleon's repeal of emancipation demonstrates both his racism and pro-slavery. However, his Egyptian campaign saw him encourage marriage between his officers and the daughters of local Muslim officials, even encouraging their conversion to Islam, an obvious political expediency, but one that no other European leader would have ever dreamed of. By the time he had crushed the second coalition against him and concluded the Treaty of Amin with the British, most of the French Caribbean territories were either in possession of the British, who reinstituted slavery themselves, had never had the abolition enforced, or they had declared independence. The war had severely drained the French treasury, and with sugar plantations being the highest national revenue earner, Napoleon was hardly in a position to jeopardize his income. So he repealed the law only so far as the West Indies were concerned, and left the status quo once the British, who had not themselves abandoned slavery, left the islands. Some enforcement of rebellious islands was attempted, which led to failure, and Napoleon fortunately soon abandoned the idea, instead opting to sell the Louisiana territories to the United States instead, to raise funds to replenish the treasury. So for Napoleon, it was essentially an emergency measure that was hardly out of step with other colonial powers, nor was it motivated out of some sense of racist ideology. In 1803, the British, who were feverishly concluding secret alliances all across Europe, broke the Treaty of Amin and declared war once again. Every man and his dog soon joined them, and France once again found itself assaulted on all fronts. Napoleon clearly saw the British as the main agitator of future conflict and prepared to invade England. But the French Navy was incapable at the time of challenging the Royal Navy, so he decided to focus his attention east instead. Once again, he conducted a lightning fast march across the Rhine with his completely redesigned Grand Armée, engaging the Austrians in one of the most brilliant military operations in history, the Ulb Campaign 
where his army totally outflanked the Austrians and at a loss of only 2,000 men, captured 60,000 prisoners, rolling on soon after to conquer Vienna. This victory was soured by the defeat of his navy by Nelson at Trafalgar, but it only strengthened his resolve to sort out the situation on the continent instead. He now turned his army north to face the larger coalition of Austrian and Russian imperial armies, crushing them in yet another textbook genius military set piece, the Battle of Austerlitz, which saw the total capitulation and carve up of Austria, collapse of the Holy Roman Empire and French conquest of the Kingdom of Naples. Nevertheless, Prussia, worried about its own future, now abandoned its previous neutrality and threw its hat into the ring, joining what was to become a rolling tag team called the Fourth Coalition. Russia turned around and decided to have another go as well, but before they even got their pants on, Napoleon had smashed Prussia in a number of key battles, occupying Berlin and wiping it out within 19 days, before liberating Poland from the Russians and taking virtually the whole Baltic coast, slapping Sweden into a backdown and once again demolishing the Russian army when it finally showed up. While he was busy knocking opponents out of the ring, Napoleon was also preoccupied behind the scenes in setting up republican governments all over the continent, abolishing feudal systems and installing modern, secular and social institutions instead abolishing serfdom in Eastern Europe, enforcing religious toleration and enfranchising the peasants with carve-ups of feudal estates that gave them all land rights. It was this social policy that brought about a huge groundwell of support within conquered territories and enlistments in his army that maintained his dominance in the arena. Recognising that Britain relied heavily on trade, he set up a continental trading system that brought down tariffs and set up beneficial trading partnerships and currency equivalencies internally, though its primary goal was aimed at restricting trade with Britain. It ultimately failed in crippling the British economy, but in a very real sense it was the germ that would eventually grow into the idea of the European common market, and eventually today's European Union. Russia, feeling the pain of restricted trade with Britain, despite gaining huge territories from Sweden in Finland, left the continental system and this was the main reason for Napoleon's decision to punish Moscow. Meanwhile, he was having the same trouble with Portugal, so he sweet-talked Spain to help him subdue dissent on the Iberian Peninsula. Receiving intelligence on a potential Spanish defection to the British, he turned on his vacillating ally, beginning the Peninsular War in 1808. Clearly by now, he had calculated that his position was unassailable, but the Russian winter and Spanish tenacity, aided by the British, saw his army hemorrhage so badly that it became increasingly clear to onlookers that the French were at last beatable. Seeing the hostility towards France was likely to be perpetual given the revolutionary nature of its institutions, Napoleon made the fateful decision to change the flavour of its government to one of an imperial nature, abandoning his original Roman Republic idea of consular head of state to one of an empire. If Europe only wanted to deal with a feudal French state, he was going to give them one, an imperial Roman one by legitimizing his own rule as emperor, which included both religious sanction as well as an heir. In addition, he was going to seed every royal house in Europe with Bonapartes, either marrying them into existing ones or simply extinguishing the other ones if need be. Trouble was, the Pope had excommunicated him, which he proceeded to rectify, and he had totally turned his back on Josephine when he returned from Egypt in 1799. The French Senate had unanimously proclaimed him emperor in 1804, and Josephine, now desperate to avoid being booted by her now estranged husband, 
expediently cleaned up her philandering ways and, to all external appearances, rose to the task of being the devoted and loyal wife of an emperor. Napoleon was still deeply in love with her, but the spell had been broken and he no longer held any matrimonial loyalty toward her, taking mistresses as it suited him, though the world would never see him write any more love letters or fall for another woman's charms. Nevertheless, it was becoming increasingly apparent that Josephine was not going to bear him an heir, so her daughter, adopted by Napoleon and married to his younger brother, had a son, whom he now proclaimed to be his heir instead. When the child soon died of croup, Napoleon, devastated, found himself in a succession crisis and began making plans to divorce Josephine more seriously in 1809 and instead marry Austrian Archduchess Marie Louise, which he did by proxy in 1810, having just crushed yet another Austrian uprising, for which this marriage would cement Austrian submission permanently. He made no secret of the fact that he still loved Josephine, but that this political marriage was necessary to save France. Despite her initial revulsion at marrying the Corsican, Marie Louise bore him a son, Napoleon II, in 1811, thus securing his dynasty and making Napoleon ecstatic with joy, and the two would go on to have a cordial and harmonious marriage. Despite his divorce with Josephine, Napoleon nevertheless allowed her to continue living her extraordinarily opulent lifestyle, supporting her financially as well as her two children, whom he adopted and treated with affection. He even insisted that after their divorce, Josephine be allowed to retain the title of Empress, unable to show any vindictiveness despite her lengthy history of infidelity and public humiliation of him. Meanwhile, by 1814, the empire was starting to crumble. Continuous onslaught by external enemies, rebellions from within, betrayal and treason by key government bureaucrats, along with a public now fatigued by decades of war, led to the inevitable collapse of the French state, with Napoleon eventually forced to abdicate and go into exile on the island of Elba. Despite Marie-Louise's requests to join him with their son, he insisted on their going to Austria and negotiate on his behalf for leniency, which they, in the end, failed to achieve. Seeing all hope as lost, he tried to commit suicide by swallowing a pill he had kept since the Russian campaign, fearful of capture during their retreat from Moscow. However, the pill was by now quite dated, and while making him severely ill, he nevertheless survived. He was now transferred to Elba, off the Tuscan coast, and given full sovereignty over the island, which at the time had a population of 12,000. In his signature style and ever the workaholic, he totally reorganised their agricultural system, oversaw the construction of new roads, schools and hospitals, expanded the operation of the local iron mine, rewrote the island's education and judicial system, and even created a small army and navy. It was while on Elba that Napoleon heard the news of Josephine's death from pneumonia in May of 1814. He was so grief-stricken that he locked himself in his room for two days. He was soon after cut off from the economic allowance granted to him by the treaty of his abdication, and news now reached him of an imminent transfer to a far-flung Atlantic outpost. In response, he arranged an escape back to France, where his small entourage was confronted by his former General Ney, along with a regiment of his former soldiers. Napoleon stood before them and outstretched his arms, declaring, Here I am! Kill your emperor if you wish! The soldiers rushed towards him and raised him up in celebration. It turns out that the restored Bourbon monarchy of Louis XVIII wasn't all they expected it to be, and Napoleon was back in Paris within days, 
with an army that had swelled to 200,000 men. Of course, the rest of Europe immediately panicked into action, with the British and Prussians being among the first to pledge troops to yet another war. Napoleon, wanting to maintain the speed of his momentum, took the initiative and attacked through Belgium, but this time British commander, the Duke of Wellington, had his measure and absorbed every energetic attack that was thrown at him. The Battle of Waterloo was a close-run affair and might have ended in another swift and brilliant French victory, but history and probably frequent excruciating convulsions caused by his poisoned, damaged stomach were now against him, such that his command of the field was significantly impaired and blunders occurred that he might not have made a couple of years earlier. His makeshift army now in tatters and returning to Paris, finding his support there drying up quickly, he soon found himself abdicating for a second time and to prevent further devastation of his country, he was swiftly transported to the island of St. Helena, a much less pleasant and convivial retirement home than Elba. His modest quarters being a ramshackle, leaky, drafty and rat-infested hovel that saw him die within a few years in May 1821. Trawling through the many articles published in the media commemorating the bicentenary, Napoleon is frequently described as a callous, power-hungry megalomaniac, a precursor and role model for Hitler, Stalin and Mussolini, not to mention a racist and misogynist. And yet, as a general, he was worshipped by his troops in a way that no other general ever has been. The Duke of Wellington once said that his presence on the battlefield alone was worth an additional 40,000 soldiers. Almost every battle he fought was against significantly higher numbers, winning more battles than Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar combined. But it wasn't all about him. Napoleon implemented judicial, educational, healthcare, currency, measurement and social reforms that remain with us to this day and certainly are not the hallmark of an autocratic dictator. While his politically expedient reinstitution of slavery in the West Indies is understandably unpalatable to modern tastes, the fact that he only implemented it in 1802 after the Treaty of Amiens and later abolished it again shows that, at worst, he was ambivalent. He was once recorded as saying that he refused to deprive blacks of the liberty obtained for them and while in exile in St Helena insisted on buying the freedom of a slave owned by a British resident. Remember that the British didn't abolish slavery till 1833 and continued the horrific practice of prisoner transportation till well after that. Moreover, at a time when Jews were persecuted and restricted to ghettos all around Europe, Napoleon emancipated them, taking a significant interest in opening up their full integration into society against all prevailing norms. This at least shows him to be anything but the kind of racist he is usually depicted to be. Certainly immensely less so than any other leader at the time, besides perhaps William Wilberforce in England. Napoleon once remarked, I will never accept any proposals that will obligate the Jewish people to leave France, because to me, the Jews are the same as any other citizen in our country. So outraged were monarchs all across the rest of Europe that the Russian Tsar condemned him as an antichrist, not because he consistently thrashed him in battle, but because he enfranchised the Jews. Moreover, he never advocated any kind of genocide, and unlike the Jacobin revolutionaries that originally motivated him, he reconciled the royalist and revolutionary factions within France during his rule and allowed the church back in, but under signed terms that first and foremost benefited France. Nor did he, as a general rule, persecute his opponents, who in almost every instance 
for 20 years were constantly scheming against him, repeatedly declaring war out of the blue and forming coalitions to destroy the Republic at every opportunity. His territorial gains were punitive reparations and peace terms imposed upon enemies that had relentlessly waged war against his government, rather than the result of some expansionist or conquistadorial tendencies of his own. To that end, his insistence while ruling Spain on greater autonomy for its colonies indirectly led to the revolutionary wars that liberated the entire continent of South America from colonial exploitation. And finally, his reverence and respect for the qualities of his mother and the importance of the institution of the family, though unfashionable nowadays, were hardly the stuff of misogyny, particularly in light of the participation of women in Corsican politics and soldiery, of which he was well aware. His undying devotion to Josephine and her children, despite tolerating years of narcissistic abuse, deception and humiliation by her, is again hardly the attitude of a lecher or male chauvinist, but rather that of what is today degradingly called a simp or a cuckold. His last words as he expired were the army and Josephine, the two great loves of his life. Napoleon was no doubt a complex figure of history and certainly no saint, but in most ways he was hardly a controversial figure. Yet he was a lover of science, philosophy and a man well ahead of his time, but also a visionary hero of the Enlightenment as well as a military genius who at times made Machiavellian decisions to conserve the integrity of his adopted homeland that was beset on all sides by paranoid monarchies. In the end, we can debate whether his self-coronation and adoption of imperial regalia were pure megalomania or a slap in the face to the entrenched feudal order. Of course, winners will write their histories and it seems that even France herself is nowadays too timid to say much positive about him. But on his native Corsica, Napoleone Buonaparte remains their greatest son and national hero.